Okay, to start us off today, we're going to focus um, at the very beginning on the advantages and disadvantages for both sides of the war. Now, I want you to look at the back of your maps that we did yesterday, and that's where we're going to start, okay? We're going to focus on the north at first, and we've already done a lot with the north. We talked about the um, advantages in population and wealth and factories, um, food crops as well. They, they're growing the crops that they're going to be able to share with the soldiers for food, for nutrients. Versus the South, it's mainly growing cash crops like cotton or tobacco. Okay. An additional thing I want you to have written down for the North is that they're well established. They already have a well established military that's been heavily trained, and they also have a well established government. Okay. For the South, the South is going to have some other advantages that the North is going to be lacking throughout the war. Those are going to include number one, um, the South is going to be able to fight a defensive war. And we've talked about this before, even with the American Revolution, that a defensive war is really key. Um, it's harder to win if you're on the offensive and the Union having to make sure that each state is coming back into the Union is going to be a difficult task. Okay. Secondly, I want to make sure you have down there that the South has better trained leaders, military leaders. Um, we're talking about Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Jeb Sewer and others that will kind of go through with the battles, but these leaders that leave the North, some of which, particularly Robert E. Lee, not because they're for the cause of the South, but because their states are leaving. And during this time period, a lot of people had more of um, a devotion to their state and their families that live there than necessarily to the nation as a whole. Okay. And then the next one will be that they're fighting on their home soil. The home field advantage is going to be there for the South because a lot of the battles will happen there. And they're used to being outdoors. They're well trained as far as shooting at moving targets. Front lines is an additional piece that I want to discuss as far as advantages, disadvantages. If you notice in the North, most of the railroad gauges are, I think that's a 4.5 and a half or 4.8 and a half. Um, and most of the railroad gauges are, are, are equal. They're the same. So it's easy to, easier to transport in the north um, from one railroad track to another supplies that the military might need. In the south, you're going to have that a little bit different for two reasons. Number one, you notice a lot less track in the south than you do in the north. Okay, and that's partly internal improvements and partly industrial areas in the north are going to build more railroad track than necessarily the south will. The second thing is you're seeing a lot of different gauges. If you look at North Carolina, we're more in line with what the North is, um, the majority of the North is, where in other areas you're seeing a little bit different, whether it's the blue or the green or the black gauges here um, with the different widths. And if you have the different widths, every time you stop and you have to load to another train instead of just switching the track and getting the train to keep going. So that's going to be a disadvantage for the South as far as railroad lines are concerned. Um, the next part I want to mention, we've gone through a lot of this factories, wealth, railroad track, um, munitions. Of course, the North is going to have the advantage to that. So just kind of keep these advantages in mind as, as we're going through. Okay, the next factor we're going to talk about is secession. And you can put this in your written notes. Um, just make sure your Roman numerals match up. And if you need to change mine, that's okay. So as far as secession is concerned, South Carolina will be the first state to secede from the Union. Of course, that is right after the election of Abraham Lincoln. Now, as South Carolina secedes, you will have six states that will follow closely thereafter, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. Um, and those states will form, in 1861, in Montgomery, Alabama, the creation of the Confederate States of America. And Montgomery, Alabama is that first area where they're going to be kind of housed and the capital will be. That will eventually be moved to Richmond, Virginia, as Virginia and other states will secede from the Union, which we're going to talk about. I do want to mention the two leaders for the South. You have um, President Jefferson Davis, Vice President Alexander Stevens. Okay, and for the Union, of course, Abraham Lincoln is going to be the leader of the executive branch. And you also have um, of course, Washington, D.C. being the capital of the Union. So here's a map of secession, just so you're able to see it. And you will notice that you have these states that seceded, 1860, 1861, South Carolina being first, and then these states following. Um, and you notice here, 
it's not really until um, April, May, and then June for these last four states to secede from the Union. And we're going to talk about how that, how that comes about. Now, for your border states, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky, Missouri, those states will not secede from the Union. Of course, West Virginia is created when Virginia decides to secede, West Virginia decides to stay. Um, at this point, these states, a lot of these, actually four out of the five, are slaveholding um, slave states. And once West Virginia comes in, that fifth one will be there as well. Um, I do want you to understand the entire Civil War, and Lincoln is worried that these states will eventually secede from the Union. So he's going to hold on. He's going to do some different things within those states to kind of keep them um, within the Union as, as long as he can. Okay? So let's kind of move to border states, um, and it discusses why they are important. Rivers that flow uh, from these states into the Confederacy will help with manufacturing. The population in these states is usually greater than in other southern states as well. Um, and here's some of the things that he will do to kind of keep hold of these states. In Maryland, Lincoln is going to declare martial law. Um, he sends in troops to kind of keep order and make sure that um, Confederate sympathizers are not rallying for um, secession in that state. He'll also suspend writ of habeas corpus, and if you remember some from civics, writ of habeas corpus is uh, making sure if you're put in jail that you're, you understand and you're told why you're there, that you're not just put there for no reason. Um, and he will suspend that for a period of time in the war in order to kind of keep hold of these border states, and that's going to be an extension of his federal power. Um, and some will argue that that was against unconstitutional, it was against what he should have done in war times. But his argument is that during times of war, writ of habeas corpus could be suspended if it's for the war effort and to protect the people in the state. Um, in West Virginia and Missouri, he will send in troops to kind of keep order there. Okay. Now, as states start to secede, there are going to be people who are still trying to stop this war, still stop secession. Um, the Crittenden Compromise is going to be one of those things. Senator Crittenden from Kentucky is going to make this compromise. He's going to attempt to push it through Congress. And the idea of the Crittenden Compromise is that let's stop secession by going back to the Missouri Compromise. Let's reestablish this 36-30 line. And below the 36-30 line, slavery would be legal. Um, you would have your slave states. And then above the 36-30 line, slavery would be illegal. Um, and you would, slavery would not be allowed. Now, Lincoln is going to reject this compromise. Um, and his influence is going to lead to the Senate rejecting it. It will not get passed, okay? Um, at this point, you still have, because remember, inaugurations didn't happen until much later. James Buchanan, at this point, is still in office. Um, and Buchanan is, is not going to do anything about secession. He thought secession was illegal, but he didn't have the right to do anything. So he's just kind of sitting there as all this is going down. Um, when Lincoln comes into office, the credit and compromise will not be passed. And at this point, we're still headed into the direction of the Civil War. The next part we're going to talk about is going to be the strategies for the North and the South throughout the war. This is on the back of your map, again, um, in the chart that you created yesterday. And we're going to start with the Northern or the Union strategy. This strategy is going to be called the Anaconda Plan. And if you think about um, the snake here that's kind of drawn in this political cartoon, the Anaconda is going to squeeze the South. It's going to cut it off. It's going to squeeze it until the South will eventually... Um, surrender and come back into the Union. Now this plan is, is um, called Scott's Great Snake as well because Winfield Scott here, um, as portrayed in the political cartoon, Winfield Scott is going to come up with this plan. We talked about him from the Mexican War. A lot of these military leaders are going to have some experience from the Mexican War. So <clears throat> what will the Anaconda Plan do? Well there's really three major parts and I'm going to throw in a fourth that I think is really important. Um, this will really be established after the first Battle of Bull Run. I do want to mention that, but I think it's important to understand before we start talking about the battles. So number one, the Union is going to seize key ports. These key ports are going to include Wilmington, um, New Orleans. It will also include Norfolk as well as um, Charleston and South Carolina. So kind of keep that in mind. They want to seize these major ports. The second part 
is they want to divide the South and the Mississippi River. This is going to be a major river source. It's going to be a contention, particularly for Grant, who's going to be leading in the West for a long period of time. <clears throat> and it's going to be a major area that the Union wants to seize, gain control of, and at that point, splitting Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana off from the South, it will be easy kind of to divide and conquer. The third part is to raise an army and take Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia is the capital of the Confederacy once Virginia will secede from the Union. It is about 90 miles from Washington, D.C., and an area that they feel like if they can, they can seize the capital, at that point the South will fall a lot faster. The fourth part that I'm going to throw in is they want to utilize Unionist sentiment from Southerners. So there's a lot of states in the South, particularly North Carolina with Western North Carolina, Georgia with Northern Georgia, um, you have, of course, West Virginia um, with Virginia, where states are divided on secession. So if the state itself was divided at that point, you know, maybe the Union could use that sentiment to their advantage. They'll have many people in a lot of these states that will be spies that will be working for the Union against the Confederate cause. Okay. Now, the Southern plan is going to be a little bit different. Um, as far as being organized, they don't have to take over the Union. They just have to survive the war and long enough for the Union to just give up and not want to take them back in. So some parts here to their plan, they're going to fight a defensive war um, throughout. They just have to keep from surrendering. They do want to attack um, within the North. But that's going to be a little bit later. Well, you'll see it with Bull Run a little bit, but a little bit later in the war, you're going to see Lee go on more of the offensive um, as the war is the war effort is declining in the South. They're not doing as well. Um, he will not be successful anytime he attempts to go into into invade the North. Um, you're going to see that at Gettysburg. Um, at other areas we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, for the Southern plan, you do have to have cotton diplomacy, which we mentioned yesterday, this idea that Europe is going to come to the aid of the South because they need cotton that bad, and, and they don't. Um, we talked about the surplus of cotton. We also mentioned that Egyptian cotton is going to come about during this time period. Um, and I do want to mention here the Trent incident, and this is an incident where a British ship, the Trent, is coming to the South from Great Britain to kind of discuss how they're going to help. And um, the ship is detained by the Union forces, and Lincoln ends up releasing the ship um, and the Southern agents who would come out to meet the ship, um, both to just go back to their area. He doesn't want to start a war. He doesn't want this conflict to, to lead to um, further escalation. So he'll release both ships, but this is just an example of that, that relationship from Europe and the South starting. Okay, probably the first conflict that Lincoln has to delve into between the North and the South. It's going to happen April 12th of 1861, so shortly after his inauguration, he's going to come in. Remember, Buchanan has not done anything. He's just sitting there watching all this happen. Um, ridiculous. But Lincoln comes in, and South Carolina being seceded from the Union, they have this fort, Fort Sumter, off the harbor of Charleston, and you kind of see that right there. There's the harbor of Charleston, Fort Sumter here. Um, and South Carolina is like, well, why do we have a federal fort in our harbor? That shouldn't be there. It should be ours because we've already seceded from the Union. We don't want federal forces out there. Lincoln, of course, wants to maintain the federal fort because if he relinquishes it, he is acknowledging secession and almost saying it's legal. Now, the fort is ro running out of materials. They're running out of supplies that they need to survive. So Lincoln has a couple of options. He can send military forces down there to reinforce it, to make sure South Carolina doesn't um, take it. He can just send supplies, or he can leave it and do nothing. He will choose to send supplies. Now, the South knows the ship is coming with supplies, and they end up firing on the fort before the supplies get there, because once that happens, they're not going to be able to get them out. Um, within this, is going to be a very short battle, 36 hours, and... The South will take the fort. General P.T. Beauregard was leading the South. Major um, Robert Anderson was in the fort. Major Robert Anderson will have to leave the fort at this point. And for the North, this is, you know, seen as, well, one, an attack on a federal fort by the South. And number two, um, they're not successful in holding the fort. So Fort Sumter will be a contention later on when, when they come back um, into the South. 